everyone and Ramadan Mubarak. My name is Salia Ahmed and I am the Director of HR and Academic Affairs for the Department of Surgery and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I, along with Courtney Sin, am the co-leader of the Asian and Pacific Islander Employee Resource Group. I'm joined today by Tanya Richards, Senior Human Resources Business Partner in Central HR and the first Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for CUIMC and the moderator for today's event, Dr. Rudina Ode Ramadan, Vice Dean for Finance and Administration at the Vagelos College of Physicians and Surgeons and Assistant <coughs> Professor of Clinical Surgical Research and Surgery. I'm excited to invite you to learn about Ramadan, the ninth month of the Islamic <coughs> calendar in which practicing Muslims from around the world fast from sunrise to sunset, abstaining from food and water. It is one of the five pillars of Islam and is widely regarded as a time of spiritual rebirth and applying it to daily life. Ramadan is one of the most festive months in the Islamic calendar. When I was growing up, my parents, a doctor and a businessman, would do everything they could to make each fast memorable. Think of having a Thanksgiving feast and Halloween candy every night for 30 days. As an adult, the significant means so much more to me. My husband and I are fortunate to be born and raised in this great country and grew up in the time that was what's Ramadan to watching New York City public schools the largest school system in the country and others, shout out to Dr. Sayed, have a designated holiday for Eid, the holiday that follows Ramadan. Back when I was growing up, Muslim equaled terrorist. My immigrant parents were struggling to give us the American dream, and that sometimes meant losing our identity and assimilating into American culture. Today, my 11-year-old daughter and I can purchase Ramadan and Eid decorations from Crate and Barrel, Party City, Amazon, Etsy, and the list goes on. We've come a long way from being portrayed as terrorists, convenience store clerks, cabbies, and other stereotypes. That's one of the main reasons uh, that inspired me to raise awareness about Ramadan, a month that is celebrated about, uh, by over about a billion people across the globe. Now more than ever, it is vitally important to educate ourselves about each other's cultures, backgrounds, and experiences. Today, we will be hearing about Ramadan memories, cultural significance, and how it is celebrated, being on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic and fasting and representation of Muslims in the global media. It is my honor to introduce our guests, Dr. Mehmet Az, Dr. Uzma Sayed, and Ms. Karishma Rahman Azmat. Our first guest, Dr. Az, needs no introduction, but let me try anyway. He is a professor of surgery in the Department of Surgery and has won 10 Daytime Emmy Awards for the Dr. Az Show. Dr. Oz received his undergraduate degree from Harvard University and obtained a joint MD MBA from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and Wharton Business School. Dr. Oz is also a proud author of eight New York Times bestsellers, including his most recent, Food Can Fix It. Dr. Uzma Sayed is a board certified infectious disease specialist, chair of the COVID-19 task force, director of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Center for, of Excellence at Good Samaritan Hospital, Medical Center and a part of the South Shore and its partner at South Shore Infectious Diseases and Travel Medicine, Medicine Consultants. Dr. Sayed is well published in pneumonia related research and has been leading several COVID-19 clinical trials. She is the founder and CEO of a 501c3 organization. She was also featured on a TEDx for her, um, for her talk on COVID-19, the ripple effect from neighborhoods to beyond. She is a community youth leader with um, with the focus on teen initiatives as a leading member of the Interfaith Council of Syosset, Woodbury, and Jericho. She also co-founded the Eid Holiday Coalition on Long Island. Her humanitarian work has spanned refugee resettlement. Ms. Karishma Rahman Azmat is the Director of International Marketing and Streaming Products and Studios for Viacom CBS. She has worked for some of the world's largest, most influential media and political campaigns, CNN, MTV, Nickelodeon, Warner Brothers, HBO, Obama for America, and the list goes on. In 2020, she served as the national talent lead for Biden-Harris 2020 Muslims for Biden, activating the Hollywood creative community with voting segments nationwide. Passionate about living a service-driven life, Karishma is a top fundraiser for Doctors Without Borders, a native of Queens, New York, the crossroads of the earth, Karishma credits her multicultural, multi-language, multi-ethnic Islamic upbringing in shaping her values and sharpening her worth ethic. A graduate of NYU, Karishma believes strongly that marginalized voices need to be heard, expressed, and represented in pop culture. Dr. Rudina Ode Ramadan is the Vice Dean 
for Administration and Finance at the College of Physicians and Surgeons. She is, uh, she's held multiple executive leadership roles, including Vice President for Research Administration at Columbia University, Associate VP for Research Administration, Executive Director of Clinical Trials, and Director of Clinical Transplant Research. Dr. O'Day Ramadan dedicated her clinical career to the pharmacological management of solid organ transplant recipients with a primary emphasis on pre and post liver transplant. Without any further ado, I'd love to start with Dr. Oz and so he can share his experiences. Dr. Oz, you are on mute. I apologize. They'll have to mute me before I go on with stations, so. Okay, you're on Dr. Oz. All right. Uh, I'm in my studio, so I, if there, all the electronics are behind the cameras that you're looking at me through, and I apologize for that. So I spent my, my schooling in this country, but I would go back to Turkey every summer. Uh, my mother's family uh, would host me sometimes, my father's family other times, and they're very different. My mother's family, uh, although both Muslim, my mother's family was more secular. My father's family was very religious, and the man who influenced me the most was my uncle Hakka, and he had actually trained in the 30s in uh, Nazi Germany because they were trying to attract Turkish loyalty and support. So they allowed students to come train there. And he saw firsthand the, the difficulty of living in a country where not everyone feels included. And when he returned to Turkey, he became one of the leaders in, in uh, engineering, in particular with a focus on agricultural issues, because especially in Turkey in the, uh, in the 40s, that was a major crisis, just making enough food for the country and allowing the the breadbasket that it could become, and that it had been for thousands of years to return. But my uncle, as well as being a very learned man at the, at the Technical Institute of Istanbul, at the big university there, and a professor, uh, was a very religious man. And it was that juxtaposition that attracted my attention. He had the ability to lecture all day long and go out into the fields and teach farmers how to use their products better, or examine better ways of farming fixing tractors, and he'd also be able to speak very thoughtfully about the Quran. Um, he went to, he uh, took my grandmother, who had been religious her whole life. She couldn't read or write, but she could say the prayers and taught me the key prayers. But he, he took her to uh, do a Hajj. Um, and he also uh, would uh, take great pride in Ramadan, or Ramadan as it's said in Turkish, because he saw it as a, the, 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 the period during which uh, the Quran was expressed, and so it was particularly sacred at that time. So for him, it wasn't just about food. It was an important opportunity to spiritually cleanse himself. And uh, I watched him do that with great admiration and saw him lead the family in that regard as well. And much of that came from my grandmother, who I alluded to very briefly, but she had left her home when she was 15. And she was married during the uh, First World War. At the time, the Turkish Ottoman army would if you're if you were an orphan, which that meant, which at the time meant didn't have a father because her father had passed away, um, and you married a soldier, the soldier was exempt from future war, which is what happened to my grandfather. So this whole story was a like out of a movie, but the importance of religion throughout it remained. Even though she left her home and never went back, uh, she became the spiritual pillar of the family. Uh, bore eleven children, half of whom died uh, when they were under two years of age, and without a guidance um, and the crutch, uh, the rock of, uh, of Islam, I, I think it would have been very difficult for the family, especially uh, uh, going through the depression in central Anatolia. Now, juxtapose that to what I was growing up with in Wilmington, Delaware, where my father had gotten a position. Uh, he knew very little about um, this country. He'd come here without understanding English that well. At the time, in the late 50s, they, the America was recruiting foreign positions. Uh, he went to Cleveland. Uh, which was a mecca for uh, heart disease, and trained there, and eventually ended up in Wilmington, Delaware, because it was close to New York City, where he knew there was an airport to take him home. And uh, there is almost no one in Delaware uh, that was Muslim. I actually don't remember going to school with anybody who was Muslim, so I became the only person who could talk, talk to folks about what Islam meant. Now there's three and a half million Muslims uh, in this country, obviously a diverse and dynamic population. Uh, I was looking up the estimates over the weekend. Uh, it's projected to double 
of the number of Muslims in this country is 7 million people by 2050. So conceptually within our lifetime. Um, and I was looking online at that same time and I just out of curiosity Googled who were the most pro prominent Muslims. Um, and I saw my name there with Bella Hadid, who's a model and DJ Khaled, who's a, DJ, uh, who's a, uh, you know, a hip hop musician, both of whom I know personally, and didn't realize that the, number, the, the way that America looks at Islam is beginning to change. Uh, none of the three of us have uh, any, any problems with you know, Middle East uh, survival issues or uh, you know, been outspoken on, um, on topics uh, that would make you uh, not want to include Islam in a, uh, in, a, in a constructive way within American culture. And I think that's a healthy way for Islam to also be reflected in this country. Uh, but we also have a responsibility um, together with that honor uh, being rep representing the Islam Muslim population here to, to show them any signs and sides of the religion. Um, no one person can speak for you know, close to 2 billion people, um, but we can speak intelligently about what this religion means to us, how beautiful it can be, um, and how it's practiced in this country. So I, there are other questions that I, I know uh, will come up that I wanna speak to, but I'll save the Q&A uh, period, uh, making more interested by saving those topics. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Oz. And so I think we have a couple of questions now, if you're willing to take yeah. those questions. Please. Sure. Okay, great. Uh, the first question are, what are the nutritional benefits of fasting during Ramadan? You know, we have these very popular uh, weight loss programs every uh, January in our, in our show. In the last few years, we focus our programs primarily on intermittent fasting. Now, intermittent fasting can be five days, eat whatever you want, or eat healthily, but as much as you want, and two days of complete fasting, or, uh, intermittent fasting done every single day. And it is based on the concept that you try not to eat for at least 12 hours uh, a day. And the window ideally is more like 14 to 16 hours um, a day. In the summer months, that's basically what, uh, what is happening during Ramadan. And intermittent fasting has been well studied for that reason, even outside the, the uh, context of uh, a religious purpose for it. Um, and assuming you're not eating poorly during iftar, you know, uh, which by the way, you actually eat pretty well, as was mentioned earlier, as a celebration. And if you break the fast with three dates, which is a pretty smart start to breaking your fast, because natural sugar is bound to fiber. So it's a gentle release of, of glucose into the bloodstream. Um, Ramadan also, uh, because of intermittent fasting, for no other reason, uh, comes along with some potential longevity benefits. Mental focus is generally achieved uh, with, with more ease when you're uh, intermittent fasting because our ancestors would do that. They wouldn't get up in the morning and eat because there would, there would be no cereal box in their cave. We'd go hunting and by the time we caught our meal, it was you know, midday and that's when you start eating. Uh, but the mental focus you one can achieve during uh, Ramadan increases the level of brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is basically miracle growth for our brain and allows our neurons to prosper for that reason. There's a distinct reduction in the amount of key hormones that you want to keep at a low level like cortisol which is produced by the adrenal gland, the so-called stress hormone. Um, and the body can also focus on detoxification when the GI tract, the intestinal tract is empty and uh, you're uh, reframing from caffeine and alcohol, two substances um, which can be problematic for a lot of folks that they don't realize it. They drink it primarily out of habit, uh, not because they even crave it usually. Uh, and it's not just about getting rid of bad habits. Uh, and it is easier to get rid of bad habits in a group, right? Because you're all together. Everyone's reinforcing everyone's belief systems. You're all going through it together. Uh, but you derive with those habits, you quit a, a benefit that's measurable in your bloodstream, but it's also measurable in your outlook towards life because it's also giving you an opportunity to cleanse your mind with your body and make you open to deeper insights. And I find uh, that with intermittent fasting, you'll often uh, be able to, to, to process complex information that you otherwise would struggle with. And it's complexity management that's perhaps most benefited uh, with fasting. And complexity management is the major stressing item or anxi most anxiety provoking item in modern America. Oh, excellent, thank you so much. And uh, number two, second question here is, can you share what representation means to you as a Muslim American? It's perhaps my biggest opportunity to give back. Representation means portraying uh, the diverse ways that Muslim Americans exist to the greater public. I remember watching the show 24, which although it was very entertaining, you know, the bad guys were always Muslims. <laughs> so if you look at how entertainment uh, uh, portrays people, sometimes it's the risks of the inner city, right? And it's only inner city people who are at risky to you. Then you sort of move from that to Muslims and then you be, maybe it's Russians 
although they're often Chechnyans who are Muslim. And, and then now I'm seeing Chinese often in that role. Um, I, I, entertainment has a, a huge opportunity, but a responsibility also to, uh, to, to demonstrate how many different ways you can be threatened. Because if you're gonna make entertainment, there's gonna be a good guy and a bad guy half the time. But we have an uh, opportunity to step beyond that. Having strong Muslim American pre presence in science, uh, which we have, is vitally critical, important because you can mentor young people who are thinking about what they can do. We lead a program, um, and I've been uh, spearheading it this year called uh, the hashtag more black doctors. One thing I've learned from my uh, black physician friends is not that they couldn't enter medical school. There are actually opportunities, the, you know, supportive opportunities for people already uh, uh, with a proclivity to practice medicine or go to nursing school or be a respiratory technician, be, you know, be involved in the health sciences, but there's no mentoring. So a high school kid never has anyone walk up and say, hey, you know, have you thought about this as a career? It's almost an accident a lot of times when that would happen. It still is an issue, but with Muslim Americans, I'm seeing the similar realities where a, a lot of young Muslim American kids, teens, uh, are not uh, reminded how cool it could be if you're practicing in a healing profession because Islam has the, kept the fire of, of medicine uh, alive for a thousand years. You know, you, you great physicians um, were able to to store the information in, in, in um, uh, Arabic libraries, that information, the rich tradition of, of healing was kept alive in, uh, in the Islamic culture. And uh, it actually transported it to Europe and jump-started a, a similar movements in, in Europe centuries later. Uh, we need to play that role. We need to, to, to stimulate and, and mentor young people who have a belief that they can be in the healing profession. This is true of all sciences, but since we have some medical experts on the call, uh, I thought I'd highlight that in particular. We have a foundation called Health Corps, um, that goes into high schools around the country. Uh, we've raised almost $100 million for this foundation um, over the last uh, 15 years. And we focus very much, not just on teaching people about kids, teens about health, but actually teaching them to go into health. Because we focus like the, health, like the Peace Corps does on taking young energetic college grads and putting them in high schools across America. It's a great opportunity to mentor. And I think uh, for Muslim American colleagues of mine who are already passed the gauntlet and are already in, in the profession, reminding ourselves to go back and, and provide that, you know, plant those seeds in the minds, uh, the, the, the smart brains of, 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 of young people in America will be wise. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. I'm glad those opportunities are there, for sure. And I have one more question specifically for you, Dr. Oz. If you were able to talk to, talk to yourself as a child, what advice would you give yourself? Or what advice would you give to kids today who may be struggling with accepting their identity? Just following up on your last Comments. Yeah, I think I, I focus in on 9-11 because pre-9-11, there was a very different perspective of, uh, on Islam in this country. And post 9-11, there's evidence that Muslim Americans have been experiencing discrimination is fairly pervasive. Um, and I'll just share two bits of data, two audit experiments that I recall um, on just on state legislators, people trying to serve in government. Um, and these, these were little experiments done to test for discrimination. And when they compare how state legislators in all 50 states assist uh, in low versus high socioeconomic class Muslim Americans, these are individuals, for example, applying for an internship in the, uh, within government or uh, you know, trying to uh, find a role for themselves in American society, when you compare their treatment to that of whites, it's, it's not equal. Uh, not only does socioeconomic status that doesn't matter to Muslims, you can be rich or poor, it doesn't matter, you don't get the same kind of treatment. Uh, whites receive more responses regardless of the socioeconomic status. Uh, it doesn't matter which party you're in. It's, this is, you know, the Democratic Party is not immune to this problem, nor is the Republican Party. Uh, it's just a, re a reflective uh, bias that's there. And it's an implicit bias that's, dis that's similar to what we see with the black community and some Latino experiments as well. And this experimental testing, by the way, uh, when you look at religious leaders re requesting an, a legislative visit, which happens sometimes, right? And your mom wants to go in and talk about something that's important to the Islamic uh, community. Uh, Imam is significantly, significantly less likely than their pastor counterparts to receive a response. And this is again, uh, both these studies are highlighting and the results are consistent that the American Muslim community and its members experience widespread discrimination, even though it's probably implicit bias. I don't even know if it's done on purpose. So as a young person, I wish someone had said, this is gonna be out there, open your eyes to it, don't get angry about it. It's just the way you change society is by nudging, 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 and by representing a world that is what you see that it could be, not necessarily what others are fearful of occurring. And I think um, that, that, that will help change people's attitudes and beliefs towards the Muslim community.
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Oz. Really, really appreciate it and your thoughts. And with that, we're going to turn to Dr. Syed, who is going to give us a glimpse of what it's like to serve on the front lines during the month of Ramadan. Dr. Syed? Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Oz, for sharing uh, your insight. And, you know, I it certainly can uh, agree with you on so many fronts. You know, mentorship is so important as uh, CEO and founder of Alinus, a 501c3 organization for high school uh, youth. Uh, mentorship is really something that is a profound way to really give back and, and nurture um, our youth and really help uh, shape our future leaders. And as Muslim Americans, I can center because, you know, we are not well represented in many industries. So I'm grateful to you and to Karishma for leading that in the media front because this is how we can be seen and heard. Um, so, you know, I think uh, the thing that's really important to remember uh, for Muslim Americans, you know, Muslims are, are diverse throughout the world, as you mentioned, and as we know, but Muslim Americans also are equally diverse. And it's really easy for people to fall into um, this, you know, notion that, you know, only Arabs are Muslims. And it's really important to remember that 25% of Muslim Americans are actually Black Americans. Um, so it's very, very diverse. You know, we have Muslim Americans who are Asian, who are Caucasian, who are Latino. Latinx. So, you know, the fabric of our country is very diverse, just as Muslim Americans are very diverse in our nation and throughout the world. So each of us has a very unique story, um, you know, and I'm, I'm sure many people can uh, relate to and, and many of our stories can resonate with many people. Um, and it's been very interesting um, for myself as well, growing up, um, you know, pre 9-11, I also like to uh, note it and post 9-11 as a visibly uh, uh, visible Muslim American uh, in my hijab. Uh, my experiences also have helped shape, uh, you know, me into the person that I am today. And for me, um, you know, I share very frequently my story, my hijab story, because I actually chose to wear hijab right before medical school. So I was, you know, well into my adulthood and um, had very different experiences. And in fact, when I started and I chose, um, it was a very um, specific time in my life where I really um, turned towards religion and spirituality. And I felt like this was something that I really wanted to do. And it, it happened to be right before 9-11. Um, and a month after me starting uh, wearing my hijab, 9-11 happened. And you can imagine how things were very different for Muslim Americans and for those of us that were you know, visibly Muslim. And there was a lot of concern from my parents, first and foremost, who were very scared as I was in medical school far away from home in Maine and visibly Muslim and you know, fear of retaliation and they really were nervous and were in fact asking me to remove my hijab for my safety. Uh, but, you know, I found comfort in my spirituality and, you know, and also having the support of friends and even my neighbors, you know, some of the nicest people I've met in my life uh, in Maine had reached out to me and said if I needed anything. So, you know, we always have to focus. There is a lot of bad out there, but I like to really um, shed light and highlight all of the good that's out there. I always believe that there are far more good people um, and good deeds out there than there are bad. And it's really important that we continue to pass the message, the positive message and, of Islam and peace in our religion. Um, being on the front lines on this pandemic has been really quite um, something else. You know, for us, Ramadan is an extremely spiritual time. Uh, it's time for reflection. It's a time for charity. It's a time for gathering with family and being grateful for all the blessings that we have in our lives. Um, you know, and it's a time where we really gather um, in large, you know, crowds. You know, we gather at the mosques, we gather with friends and loved ones uh, for iftar, breaking up the fast. We celebrate, you know, this holy month together. And, you know, the pandemic has really shifted so much of this. Last year, we were so much um, in a lockdown where we were confined to essentially our immediate families and our bubbles. And, you know, we did not get to see our friends and families. I didn't see my parents for four months. Um, I and see my, my sister and her family. And it was really different experience. Um, that on top of being on the front lines in New York, where we were hardest hit by the pandemic um, and leading the task force, was a really difficult experience um, physically, mentally, emotionally. But again, for me, Ramadan came as something of, of an ease. You know, it's that time of spirituality, that time to reflect, where I actually found solace in that, where I found that the prayers that I had five times a day helped really ground me in this time of despair, in this time of difficulty 
faculty where we were facing the most difficult things we had ever experienced in our lives. Patients uh, after patients coming in through our ERs, you know, gasping for air, young, old, you know, all ages where we were not able to help them. You know, we're used to nursing people back to their health, especially in infectious diseases. For us, it's very cerebral. You take a great history, you figure out the diagnosis, you know what the diagnosis is, you have the treatment for it, you get people better and you get them home. We were in uncharted territory now and we were seeing people you know just coming in terribly sick and we felt helpless where we couldn't help them everything that we had uh, that we knew up until now was not working for them so it was a very very difficult time and that along with you know this time of year that is so spiritual for us um, you know i found that although it was difficult you know with the fasting and the masks and the eyewear and all the ppe that we had to wear again that spirituality for me at that time of uh, in that month really helped ground me and really helped give me more strength to get through these difficult times. Um, so, you know, Muslims across the world um, were fasting. Muslims across our nation, nation were fasting during this month and being on the front lines. So things were different in the sense of our usual celebrations. Um, but I personally found a lot of strength from this month and a lot of benefits from this month. And again, to be able to give thanks um, to God to have all of the blessings um, that we were so grateful for. We have a roof over our heads, we have food on our tables, we have the luxury of social distancing, and you know, many of us were able to work from home, whereas there are people in this world who you know, are, are homeless, who don't have food, who don't have the luxury of having access to clean water when we're telling people to wash their hands every day you know, for 20 seconds, or we're telling people to socially distance. We have people in refugee settlements who can't be away from each other. So, you know, all these things to really put it into perspective of how precious life is and how grateful we should be for everything that we have. And this Ramadan is a little bit different from last Ramadan, where we have made so much progress in this past year. We've had scientific breakthroughs uh, on the vaccination fronts, and we are setting new records every day with the number of people we're able to vaccinate. And really, it is a race against the variants. It is a race in this pandemic. But the more people that we get vaccinated, the closer we are to reaching that end of having this pandemic behind us. And with the light being at the end of the tunnel where we can see that light finally, we are now able to still cautiously um, operate you know, a little bit uh, more differently this Ramadan where we can get together with family members that are vaccinated um, you know, and in small, small groups. For example, my parents, senior citizens are both vaccinated and I plan on having iftar with them every night because my household is vaccinated as well. And the only one in my household who's not vaccinated is my young um, son who's doing virtual school. So for us, we're able to blend those bubbles together. So again, we're going to be very grateful for all the blessings that we have. And my colleagues in medicine, again, are still on the front lines because we are still not out of the woods just yet, but we have come a long way and we are treating people earlier and we are saving a lot more lives. And with vaccines, we're able to save even more lives. So, you know, we're, we're grateful for everything that we have at this point. Excellent, thank you very much, Dr. Syed. And we really, we all thank you for all that you're doing on the front lines, you and your colleagues. Um, very interesting perspectives, and I have some questions coming through on the chat. But I think what I'll do is, um, if you're ready, uh, Krishma Rahman Asmat, I'll turn to you so you can give us um, uh, your perspectives on the representation of Muslims in uh, global media. And then what we can do is turn to the chats as these are coming in, um, and we can collectively answer these questions. Okay, so with that, I will turn to you. Happy Krishma. to start, and I think this is a fantastic conversation, both on the interconnectedness of our stories and just the fact that you know, Dr. Oz, Dr. Sayed, and myself are, are speaking the same language in three different ways. Absolutely. So you are the heroes, and I am the storyteller. You guys are in, in the hallways doing the work, and I get to be behind the scenes, behind the cameras telling those stories. But it hasn't always been like that. So to start about being Muslim in America, I would say America, Islam is the most American of religions. Thomas Jefferson had a Quran. The first slaves that landed on these shores were Muslims, oral histories have told us. So I ground myself not in my otherness, although there is a tendency and a history of otherizing people in this country, to say, no, I belong. No, I represent myself. And no, I stand for who I am in my community, imperfect that I am. Um, Dr. Oz mentioned the culture. I believe as a marketer, as a global marketer and, and a global storyteller, that if you shape the culture, you change the culture. 
when you see a Muslim doctor, not only on TV, but the one that's actually treating your father in the COVID ward, it's very hard to villainize them. When you see a Muslim athlete with a categorically Muslim name, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, it makes it that much easier for you to buy that jersey and to transition into, you know what, maybe they're not that different. It's hard for a marginalized people, black, indigenous people of color, to always have to prove and demonstrate that, hey guys, we're not that different. We're just like you and that, that's heavy. And that weighs heavy, especially generationally. Think about you know, Dr. Oz's father's journey of landing in a place where he didn't know a single soul, wanting to be close to an airport where he could maybe go home, to the experiences we know, you know Dr. Ramadan, maybe you had growing up in, in the Midwest about what you could pass as or be considered as, to Dr. Sayed, that representation of, do I take my hijab off as a young medical student? Do I do this? to myself as a kid growing up in the city, as a 9-11 a high school team, that's what I was when those towers fell down. So we choose our identity, we code switch, we know how to say to what to whom, but what do we do with that? So when I chose to disappoint my parents by not becoming a doctor like all of you and choosing to study media and marketing, I made it my life's work in whatever capacity and moving up the ladder to make sure that marginalized voices, intersectional voices, and the voices that didn't have a seat at the table, particularly of a very insular and incestuous community like the entertainment community. Everybody knows everybody. Everyone's connected in the industry, and it's very hard to get a leg in. So when you work for the largest brands in the world, like CNN, Game of Thrones, HBO, Viacom, CBS, MTV, Nickelodeon, these have billions and billions of people as their audiences. And those characters that they see are seen around the world. So not only are these brands a representation of our Americanness, they are our representation of Americanness to the world. So in working on these brands and working on the content, it, it, it is always mindful in my mind of how am I uh, leveraging those voices. So one of those things that, you know, that's so fun to work on right now is SpongeBob SquarePants. Riveting, I know, but also the number one cartoon on earth. And you only need to ask any child between the ages of four and probably 40, um, that it is their favorite cartoon. What does it mean now that we're working where SpongeBob is celebrating Ramadan? He's gonna be wearing a little hat. He's gonna wear like maybe a, you know, a little Turkish fez in different parts of the country, parts of the world. He's gonna be talking to the billions of children who have never seen themselves as anything than other. And it can be done in jest and it can be done in, in a funny and witty way, but that when you shape the culture, you change the culture. When you have Riz Ahmed, the first ever Muslim, Muslim you know, nominated for an Oscar in the best actor category, you shape the culture and then you change the culture. And it's so important for us as Muslim Americans to stand in our own two feet, to own our space, but also to understand that we're not perfect. I am nobody's savior. I cannot change the identity of billions of people around the world. All I can do is stand for myself and those voices that are like mine. Um, and and um, like Dr. Oz was saying, when you have a Bella Hadid that talks about being undefined, you know, defiantly Palestinian American and proudly so, or my own upbringing of, of being South Asian and being Muslim, a South Asian Muslim, where a lot of our, our, our understanding of Islam came from the Turkish elements, how we recite, how we pray, how we decorate and ornament our jainamas, our prayer rugs, that all comes from, from the Ottoman Turks not so much from the Arabian culture. So when you realize the intersectionalness of our DNA, and like I said, the fact that the first slaves in this country were Muslims, uh, I'm, I'm grounded in the stories that we tell. I'm empowered by that. But I also am very aware of the bullied, overweight, lower middle class girl that happened to also be Muslim in the biggest city in the world during Ramadan, not eating lunch at the fifth grade cafeteria, and the girl saying that she's strange or maybe she's trying to diet, or maybe something's wrong with her. Why doesn't she eat? The religion is so weird, it's so mean. So going from that in the same city to now having Ramadan and Eid al-Fitr off, um, just in the course of my going into high school and, and, and now being an adult um, is quite profound. But again, shape the culture and then you change the culture. Absolutely, thank you so much. It's, it's very powerful, and you're right. We've all had those experiences where we've had to prove our Americanness and and what that means. Uh, and with that, um, Dr. Syed, can you share with us? I know that um, as you said, you've decided to wear the hijab 
later in life and right before medical school and what that means to you and having to prove your Americanness. And I'm sure that it, it, you encounter that on a, a frequent basis if you want to share any of that with our viewers. Absolutely. I would love to. Um, and as I was saying before, you know, uh, I have different perspectives on, you know, what uh, it's like to be Muslim American, you know, in my childhood, where it was a fairly normal childhood, and this was pre 9-11. And then post 9-11, where it's the struggle to constantly prove ourselves that, you know, we are good um, Americans contributing members of the society. And then, you know, you throw on the hijab as well. And that's a whole other level of, you know, stereotypes that you have to break down where people always assume that you're being forced to do this. Did your husband make you do this? You know, all, all of these stereotypes that come along and these barriers that you have to break and really educate people. A lot of it is from uh, ignorance and just lack of knowledge, um, lack of exposure where someone might have these questions because they've never met a Muslim American before. So, you know, I use that opportunity to really educate people. Um, for me personally, uh, you know, on a daily basis, uh, I can't tell you, I always say if I had a penny for every time a patient said to me, oh, you have perfect English. You don't have an accent at all. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is the comment that I get very, very frequently because oftentimes, you know, you're already being judged before you even, you know, have a conversation with a patient or a colleague or anybody that you might encounter, you know, a clerk at the store, anyone that you might encounter. Um, so, you know, that first encounter, you know, people look at you and the first thing that they get, uh, you know, that image of you in a hijab and they start formulating all kinds of opinions and thoughts. And so the first question that I get, and oftentimes at work, I also say this frequently, that if I had a penny for every time uh, I walk into a patient's room in my white coat with my ID that says Dr. Syed, um, you know, a person might be on the phone, a patient might be on the phone or, or speaking to somebody and they look at me and they say, oh, I have to go, my nurse is here. Um, you know, I'll have a male, you know, medical student with me and they'll start speaking to the male that's with me because assuming again that they're, you know, the physician and I'm the nurse. And, and this is, you know, some something that's um, categorically been there for, you know, culturally, I mean, if you even look at children's books for, you know, years and years and decades and decades, there's always the story, the narrative is always that the doctor is a male and the nurse is a female. So this is, again, breaking down these barriers, you know, whether it be as, as a woman, uh, uh, Muslim American woman, uh, visibly uh, Muslim American woman, especially. So these are things that, you know, I like to educate, um, you know, my patients or anybody that I have this encounter with, because the first notion is always that you're an immigrant or that you're not American. Um, so once, you know, we start conversing and they see that, you know, I'm fluent in my English and then they say, I don't have an accent. And I follow that up with, well, of course I don't. I'm American. <laughs> I grew up here. And then we go into the entire conversation and it's just, you know, peeling back all those layers and really making people feel comfortable and then using that opportunity to really educate them. Um, I mean, it's just really what it's about. And, you know, for this reason, I've been very active um, outside of medicine as well. You know, in, in the medical field, you know, we certainly have fair enough representation of Muslim Americans, but as I was mentioning before, in media and other industries, we don't have that many Muslim Americans that are visible. Um, so for me, my community engagement came very early on and I became very engaged in our community. Um, I was able to get Eid approved as a, a district holiday and I formed the National Eid Holiday Coalition so that districts across you know, the country can have Eid recognized so that students can feel that sense of belonging um, and parents can feel like they are contributing members of our society and it bridges um, you know, that gap that we have for communication between um, school members, faculty, and the community, especially after 9-11 where students feel so marginalized um, and they're constantly trying to prove themselves that, you know, that they do belong, that they are American, and it's a great way for community engagement as well on all aspects. Um, I ran for school board to really have that presence, you know, that visible Muslim presence so that people can see and have that positive image. Um, and as we know, there have been more and more Muslim Americans that have been running for office. So, you know, these are all different ways that we can really incorporate ourselves and, and let people know that, you know, we are more than, um, than just doctors and lawyers. We have so many assets to us and aspects to us. And, uh, and it's really important that people recognize that, you know, we are significant contributors to our society. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. And I have some uh, questions coming through in the chat. This one is for you, um, Karishma. And it's specifically uh, states, I love what you said about representation helping to shape and change the culture. How can people who are not Muslim work to be allies and to help to change stereotypes and prejudice against friends in the Muslim community? 
Thank you for that question. Let's be friends right now, whoever sent that. Uh, I think that's how it all starts. Um, thank you for even expressing that. So I think the way we support each other in allyship is intersectional support and listening. I love what, what Dr. Oz said about, you know, black physicians. We have to listen to our black brothers and sisters, hear their stories and their experiences, not question them, not offer our own two cents, but listen first. And I think inside of that, for your supporting of the Muslim community, hear us. Hear us when we're afraid of, of wearing hijab and, and, and maybe walking on the street. Hear us when we feel like our kids are being a little bit bullied. Hear us when we say things like, oh, my name is Charisma, but you, you, um, it doesn't really matter. You can call me Charisma. It's totally fine. You can pronounce it. When we minimize ourselves, when we, uh, to, again, for fear of otherization, you'd be like, no, Charisma, tell me how you pronounce your name and we'll pronounce it properly. So small things become large things. But uh, inside of your, your beautiful question, an even more beautiful sentiment, I think, is listening. And as we listen to more of our stories, we'll recognize it's the same story. It's the same song being sung by different people. So when you talk to our, our black and indigenous brothers and sisters, where you talk about the Latin and Latinx communities, about how they call themselves, how they identify themselves, how they stand for themselves um, and their fears, they're actually a big old Venn diagram of the same fears. So to, to be the best ally, I think we have to be the best listener and then uh, proper listening allows us to be the best advocates for our, for our intersectional allies. Absolutely, thank you. Yes, it's Great question. Uh, and Dr. Oz, I have a question for you. How do you find time for religious obligations? You know, like everything else, you make time for the things that matter to you. I actually think one of the fundamental success nodes of American society is the fact that we have faith and that we prioritize it and focus on it. My mother-in-law is a minister, actually. Uh, my wife is studying Jungian psychology and uh, we've been married 35 years. So she's continually learning and uh, and improving herself. And I spend a lot of my dinners with the kids, uh, which we in, enforce a strict no electronics code, which I suspect many of you are thinking about as well, um, forcing them to talk to me about, uh, about faith. And, and not doing it in a way that's uh, browbeating, but actually talking about the bigger questions that, that, it, that it helps answer. So uh, for me, it's just part of what I do. For, I'm also blessed that on the television show, it comes up periodically, because for a lot of Americans, especially now, who feel atomized, who feel separated from each other, uh, reminding them and myself that uh, we have a 12,000 year history of living together. The first civilization uh, that we know of that had uh, temples, and that was our first big gathering point, was a place called Gebek de Tepe, which means Potbelly Hill. It's in uh, southeastern uh, Turkey, the, the head of the, the uh, Tigris Euphrates rivers. And uh, this community, which, by the way, Abraham met Sarah. Uh, very close to there uh, as well, uh, who we married and uh, gave and spawned much of what we're talking about. Uh, but this community realized that you could come together and by, in their case, worshiping these, uh, th the world above them, these T-shaped uh, uh, temples that they built were about 17, 18 feet high. They still exist today. And it's an interesting observation because I was always brought up thinking that agricultural communities freed us to have a little a disposable time that we could then spend focused on religion. In other words, without, us, without the ability for us to domesticate uh, animals and grow crops, we couldn't have had religion. It turns out it was the opposite. These guys were hunters and gatherers. And when they realized that they could unite together and, and pay homage and respect to something bigger than them, a deeper uh, collective subconscious that, that, that connected everybody, that allowed them to come together to, to actually have domestication of animals, to, to catch the animals, the, in that case, the, uh, the gazelles all at once, um, to plant crops together. They could actually do division of labor. And it's actually religion that allowed them to become agricultural. Um, and that's, that's actually an important part of our heritage we sometimes forget. We got where we are because we could uh, seize in each other the divine spark. Uh, which is part and parcel of what Islam represents. There's a responsibility that comes with that as well, but that's what makes humans special is our ability to respect each other at a much deeper level. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and Dr. Syed, I have a question for you. Uh, at what point, if someone has a chronic illness recovering, for instance, from COVID, can they, should they start fasting again? And I guess in, in follow-up to that, who can be exempt from fasting? 
So those are great questions. So I think that's one thing that um, I would love for people to know is that, you know, Islam is, is a very flexible religion. And I think that's one thing that is often misled, you know, um, the, the narrative that's out there is that it's very restrictive or there, you know, there's so many things that are rigid about it. And in fact, it's quite opposite. Um, you know, we know that, um, as we've been discussing before, that Muslims will be fasting from sunrise to sunset, but there are a lot of exemptions in there. So for example, children are exempt from fasting, pregnant women are exempt from fasting, people who have medical conditions, um, you know, are exempt from fasting. So there's many leeways in there. And if you miss a fast for whatever reason, whether you're not feeling well that day, you have uh, the leeway to make it up at the end of the month. Um, that being said, you know, it, that it's really important for people to know that obviously you have to consult with your medical physician based on your medical history and your medical conditions, whether or not a fast, especially if it's something that you're starting, it's a new thing that you're starting, that if it's going to be safe for you to go forward with it um, and keep in mind, you know, the medications that you personally may have to take. As far as COVID goes, we know that people do suffer um, lots of symptoms even after they've recovered from their acute illness from COVID-19. And this is being studied in depth right now. Lots of research is being done uh, on this and people can have ongoing fatigue. They can have ongoing respiratory symptoms, cardiac symptoms. You know, people are unwell for weeks and weeks and even months. Um, so that being said, if this is something that would be difficult for you to do, then again, the religion is not restrictive. You know, you have to consult with your medical physician. And if this is something that becomes very difficult for you to go ahead with the fast, then, you know, you can consult with your physician, with your Islamic scholar, and there's a lot of leeway in there. You know, you still can give to charity, um, you know, all the things that you would be doing in this month, because this month is really about reflection. You can still pray, you can still be spiritual, you can still read the Quran and, you you know, have that spirituality. Um, but if the, the fasting itself is becomes difficult for you, then there are other ways for you to really reflect during this month. Thank you so much. And Krishma, a question for you. You mentioned the changes with SpongeBob and uh, we know about DJ Khaled. My kids are huge fans of DJ Khaled. Uh, where do you see media go? We still see things as Dr. Oz mentioned, 24, and we still see the portrayal of, of terrorists. Uh, and where do we, sometimes I, I'm afraid to have my kids watch certain shows because of that. Where do you see media going over the next five to 10 years? And are we moving too slow or is this standard with other biases we see? The personal answer is yes, we're absolutely moving too slow but there is a reason for that. If the show creators are not Muslim American, if the actors aren't Muslim American, if the producers are not Muslim American, if the studio heads are not Muslim American, if the advertisers are not Muslim American, there is no agency for anyone to push back except for my lonely voice in the room, one out of none, as they say for many of us that are uh, uh, different to push back and say, guys, I'm kind of not comfortable with that portrayal, or it doesn't always have to be this way, or, oh, Karishma, you're just being sensitive, or we didn't really mean it that way. Think about all the great work that you and Tanya and everybody does, the fact that there is a diversity and inclusion, but the most important word, equity uh, component of all of our major corporations came out of, 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 of Black Lives Matter. And the fact that, wait, we need a level set, but that level set only happens when there are equitable voices behind the camera and in front of it. So where do I think moving forward? Where does my hope lie? Where do I find the hope that the Dr. Oz and, and Dr. Sayed were talking about? It's our youth. So I deal as, an el I am an elderly millennial, so I have to deal with uh, Gen Z and what they're calling uh, Gen C, Generation COVID, those are un that are under five, that have no reality besides learning on a, on a box and learning uh, that we, and watching TV on a box on the screen. This generation is ridiculously diverse and they don't see otherness. They might see otherness in things. We've done research on, 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 on different companies I work for where they see otherness, well, he has this kind of bike and I have that kind of bike, or they have an iPad and this type of video game, but they don't necessarily see the otherness of, well, if, if it's okay if they're black or if it's okay if you know um, they, they speak Spanish, but how did that happen? We rooted it back to, again, a broken record, shape the culture, change the culture. When you have a Disney princess for the first time that's black and her name is Tiana and Princess and the Frog, two generations later, you don't talk about her being the first black Disney princess, you talk about Tiana as Princess and the Frog. Or Coco bringing beautiful Latin, Mex un unabashed Mexican culture to the, to the forefront at Disney. 
um, and, and telling that story proudly. And now you have a whole generation of kids that I know what Dia de los Muertos is, but without a, a stigmatized to it. So I think that when we encourage our children to stand for their dreams and not necessarily force fit them into the doctor, lawyer, engineer mindset, whatever it is that our uh, immigrant or, or, or parents wanted for us. But if we tap into their art, we tap into their creativity, we tap into what they do best, they can be our best Muslim American ambassadors. And then you can find and replace and change Muslim American to any kind of ambassador you want them to be. So Dr. Ramadan, I would say continue to watch what your children are watching. But I do have hopes um, that as this generation of, of actors and showrunners and film creators and hopefully some more friends of mine uh, uh, get seats at the table, um, the culture will shift. Wonderful, thank you. I'm and I, just, if I can add on really quick to what Karishma was saying. I'm a firm believer in controlling the narrative. I just want to say also that there recently there was an Arab um, American actress, I believe her name is Serena Rasul, who started her own casting um, company. And I think that's where the issue lies as well, is that there's so much, um, you know, hindrances in people, even in, let's say, you know, uh, for actors in that industry, where they're being, you know, typecasted and, and stereotyped into certain roles. So by having somebody who's Muslim American starting their own agency, it gives you that avenue to really have that representation and to control that narrative. That's right. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and Dr. Oz, I have a question that has come through a, a, a few times in different ways. So I'm going to piece it together here. Uh, in, so we talked, we talked a little bit, you talked a little bit about the benefits, uh, the nutritional benefits of fasting. So on the flip side, returning back to your normal routine, is there any advice you can offer or is there any uh, specific manner in which you have to return to your normal routine to prevent excessive eating or uh, feeling ill or any uh, side effects like that? After 30 days, most people will have a sense that they don't need to put the same stuff in their belly that they were putting in the, their, you know, the, the, in the prior months. And that's something we find across the board. And uh, uh, after the, the, the fast, it's actually quite prominent. Uh, a couple of words of caution. First off, uh, you adjust your eating habits quite a bit. And so you want to take advantage of that. Why throw away all that great opportunity to not be so addicted to caffeine first thing in the morning? The first couple of days of uh, fasting are difficult, uh, I think most people experience, because they're giving up some of the things that sort of got them through the day, that extra bolus of caffeine, a drink in the evening to relax, whatever, the, whatever your normal uh, protocol is has now been adjusted and altered. But oftentimes it's adjusted in a better direction um, because um, of the reasons we spoke of earlier. So with that, that protocol in place, most people can actually copy bits of it. As an example, if you're not going to eat for a 12-hour window, 12 hour window, maybe you sort of delay breakfast a couple hours in the morning. So you maintain the benefit that came just as, a, you know, coincidentally out of going through the fast. I also think it's important for people not to binge the other direction. The holiday that follows the fast is, a, a, you know, you can do a lot of damage in those couple of days. In Turkey, for sure you do. Um, but I think also even during the fast, be careful about what you're eating when you're allowed to eat. Uh, sometimes people actually gain weight during the fast because uh, they're, they have understandable concerns about long days uh, getting longer these, this time of year of not eating. And so they'll, they'll overeat when they're allowed to. You don't want that habit to persist when you go back to more regular existence. Thank you. That's excellent. I, I, I tend to, people always ask me the question, you must lose a lot of weight during Ramadan. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. I've, I've never learned quite that. So I'm taking notes on what you say <laughs> because I tend to gain. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. And um, uh, this one I'll give to Dr. Syed. So if you're unable to fast because you just went through uh, the list of those who are exempt from fasting, is there anything else you can do during the month of Ramadan? Absolutely. Some of those things I mentioned before, but you know, you can certainly give to charity, um, you know, as much as you possibly can. And we have to remember that there, there are people, no matter how bad our situation is, you know, to be reminded that there are people that are in worse situations than we are in. Obviously, this pandemic has really uh, crippled so many of us um, throughout our nation and throughout the world. Um, but you have to realize that ultimately, you still have a lot to be grateful for, no matter how, you know, bad the situation is, always find that silver lining. Um, so I think giving to charity is really, really important. Um, doesn't have to be anything elaborate. You know, it can be even in your own neighborhood, in your own, you know, um, town or city, if you, you know, you find people that are in need. And then obviously you can go broader than that. You can go nationally, you can go globally, you can whatever charity that you find, um, you know, 
any comfort in that you find that you want to give to, you can. Um, but you know, providing food uh, for people that are in need is really, really uh, a big thing. And that's really what this month is about, is about not being wasteful. It's about you know, really reflecting on how much um, you have to be grateful for and the blessings of this month and to really kind of pay it forward. Thank you. Uh, and I have, uh, I have a, 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 more questions here, but I see we're running low on time. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask uh, two quick questions and then I'll have one question for all of you. We'll go around the table to answer. Um, the first question is, uh, can you give blood during the month of Ramadan? And I, I'll ask that Dr. Oz. You can do whatever you can, that you need to help other human beings. That's part of the underlying reality. So whether your life's at risk or someone else's, uh, do what's required. Great. And the other question that has come through is, why does Ramadan change throughout the year? Different timings. What's special about the month of, of, of from this month? Well, it's, it's based on the lunar calendar. So it's just because the calendar shifts, uh, naturally the moon becomes available. There's a whole art form to seeing the moon for the very last time just as it's coming up to indicate the end of the holiday, which everyone looks forward to, but it's the same from the very beginning as well. And then uh, it's, I, I don't know why the lunar calendar was a dominant calendar. Some smarter than me knows that, but uh, there, it's followed meticulously for this process. Great, thank you. I mean, this has been a tremendous discussion and I feel like I can continue. I have a lot of questions here. I can continue to go on, but uh, in, the, uh, in the essence of time, I have one question I'll ask each of you in sort of our, our final uh, fire round here. I'll start with you, Dr. Syed. What does Ramadan mean to you? So Ramadan is an extremely um, spiritual, uh, blessed time for me. I mean, from all of my memories from childhood to now and to creating more memories with my children, um, it is really a sacred time, as I mentioned before, a time for reflection, a time for charity, a time for giving thanks. And really kind of, um, it's that time where you get to reset um, and kind of really anchor yourself in preparation for the upcoming year. So not only is it an important time spiritually, physically, you know, the fast is really a nice cleanse where you really, um, as Dr. Oz mentioned, you have mental clarity, um, you're eating better, you know, you're physically more fit. And, you know, it really is a great way to kind of reset and, and start the year with, you know, grounding yourself mentally, spiritually, and, and kind of developing good habits and trying to hold on to those good habits. Even, you know, we talk about fasting just from food, but Muslims are supposed to fast from, abstain from, you know, bad behavior, you know, arguing, backbiting, violence, you know, so we try to hold on to these habits, remind ourselves that, you know, we should be good human beings and, and take this with us as the year continues. That's right, excellent point, not just about the food. And uh, Karishma, do you want to tell us? Uh, in your I'm just, I'm, I can't even talk. I'm just terrified that Dr. Oz is going to see my 20 ounce iced coffee. So I am just, I'm trying to keep it out of frame. Um, what Ramadan means to me is a return to factory settings type reboot for the personal spiritual soul element of it. How do I get better? How do I live better? How do I, how do I eat better? How do I feel better? But in a larger context, my grounding myself into the universe. I am so much uh, I'm small in comparison to the, the, the magnanimity and the greatness and the grandness of the earth. What can I do for others? How can I serve others? And living in New York 14, which is the epicenter of the COVID crisis, that shows its face every single day. So it's, a, it's an affirmation of how I can be a better person and how I can take that best part of me, that divine spark that Dr. Oz talked about, that God gifted and granted all of us, and how do I parlay that into the universe and, and do for others as well. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Oz, you can close out by telling us what Ramadan means to you. You know, it's not just about bad behaviors, it's bad thoughts, you know, thinking uh, in ways that don't take you forward. So for me in a word, it's purification, it's cleansing uh, and the discipline of hope uh, because to make the world better, disciplines it both internally, which are the harder ones and externally are important. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Sal. I hope I kept in the time frame there, Sal. You but sure did. Discussion. Excellent. <laughs> you are awesome. And thank you so much, Dr. Sayed, Karishma, Dr. Oz, for doing this today. My heart is ready to explode. I think my face is ready to like I don't know, go where, but I am also drinking my coffee, um, non-fat milk with one Splenda just for Dr. Sayed and Dr. Oz. So I'm trying to get my caffeine fix in um, before we start fasting tomorrow. 
And I just wanted to say thank you again for doing this. Representation does matter. And Dr. Oz, from the beginning, you were on board and you were so excited about this event. And I can't begin to tell you how amazing it is for all of us here to have you join us. Dr. Sayed, thank you for fighting for us on the front lines. And Karishma, keep fighting on. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. Ramadan Mubarak. Bye. Thank Mubarak. you. Bye. Ramadan Mubarak. Bye-bye.